You're listening to Casterbus. My name is Christian Corley. Listening and listening and talking along with me is James McLean. We're here to discuss some recent events in the world of Doctor Who. James, how are you doing? I'm okay, thank you. Good. I'm quite well myself as well. Oh, sorry, as I meant to reciprocate. <laughs> it was taken as red. Um, I see. <laughs> um, anyway, so. Oh, oh, look at that. Well, actually, this is probably worth a mention, actually. It's absolutely nothing to do with Dot 2. As we record this, some uh, there's been a World Cup final football match taken place, which I wasn't watching because uh, I struggled with uh, most football as it is, so I wasn't going to make any exception for anyone else's football. And uh, my sister's just uh, messaged me to say that Bob Geldof was in the same bar as her watching the match. Oh, OK. There you go. Isn't that interesting? Anyway, yeah, so uh, the uh, England women's football team have just won the World Cup against Germany. So there you go. Anyhow, that's the wider world, which we're not really interested in right now because we're here to talk about Doctor Who. First of all, uh, Sagan Akinola has announced he will be leaving Doctor Who with the next episode, which, I mean, it's not the huge surprise. Many are speculating that Davies is bringing back Murray Gold, who worked on Doctor Who through to 2005 to 2017. I'm not so sure it will be Murray Gold, simply because it's not that long since he left. What do you think? Yeah, I don't know. It would be the sort of thing that Davis does. But, yeah, I agree. It would be very odd. It would almost feel like, um, I don't know, it could mean two things, couldn't it? It could either mean that uh, Gold left perhaps when he didn't really want to and is therefore happy to come back. Or it could be, which seems to be the case, is that Davis's production was a very enjoyable, creative world and people seem to be happy to come back to it. Yeah, it could be that. Then again, I mean, in fairness, he worked more on Moffat's Doctor Who than on... That is true. Davies. But that's still still the point, though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. The point isn't that... Um, it's not to say he didn't like working on Moffat's, but I'm oh, just God. saying that there seems to be a, a stronger magnet to Davies's creative world than maybe Moffat's, which you know, through hearsay and conversations was sometimes strained for various reasons. So maybe, maybe, or maybe not. We, we don't know, do we? We don't even know if he's coming back. So We don't. Um, and, um, I mean, on the, on the same note, there has been a rumour that, I'm pretty sure I've seen it somewhere. I don't seem to be able to find it in time for this episode. Uh, uh, mention of Stephen Moffat coming back as well to write in the next series of Doctor Who. Is that a surprise? Just, it's the same thing, isn't it? Is, is it because, you know, that Davis is quite easy? Well, he's by his own admission, he's not always easy to get on with, but the results and uh, the dynamics is something that people enjoyed. People I knew who worked on that pr part of that production really enjoyed it and felt very much part of a family. But who's to say? With Moffat, it might simply be that, you know, it's, be nice to go and do something Doctor Who without feeling the pressure of being the showrunner. Yeah. But then, I mean, Davis was allegedly behind the scenes quite a lot in uh, Moffat's era, um, in a sort of, a, what, from what I get an impression of, in a sort of friend way, in a sort of supportive friend way, I don't know. Um, they seem to have more. quite... A, yeah, I, I mean, I've been thinking about this recently. I was wondering whether it's more of a sort of Barry Letts in 1981 sort of a role. Like unofficial crediting of uh, some sort of uh, upper executive. Well, then again, it may just have been as well. The, uh, I don't know. The I mean, Davies I, sounding board, maybe. I just remember, I mean, recently, I think Davis sort of said that, uh, I, th I think it was over shooting. I think he, I think he said that, He'd spoken to Moffat about it, you know. So there was there's a certain amount of dialogue that goes on between the two when, yeah, arguably yeah. there shouldn't be or doesn't need to be. So it makes me wonder, as you say, that I think I think Davis might have had some sort of executive behind the scenes input on some of the stuff in Moffat's era. Yeah, not in an executive above Moffat way, but in a sort of background way. But um, certainly, I remember hearing several times that he was involved in conversations. Anyway, so maybe. Yeah, maybe he is the godfather of New Who that people are quite happy to go and work for. Maybe, um, maybe, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's it's money either way, isn't it? I guess so. You know, you could sort of say, well, yeah, it's 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 a it's a it's a gig, isn't it? It's a gig, a comfortable and easy gig to some degree. But 
I don't know, there just seems to be a vibe, electricity around Davis's work, which seems to galvanise or, or attract um, creative people. But I don't know. I don't know. Because I say, if you read the writer's tale, you hear Davis quite honestly saying that how he could be, um, you know, quite, quite, quite horrible when he, you know, when he was really stressed. So, you know, I don't know. I don't want to over, um, I don't want to uh, over idealize no, no, his, no, no, his no. productions and sort of into something that it's not. But I don't know. I'm, I'm, it might also be that, you know, with him coming back, there's a sort of a good vibe coming on that people are like, you know, in the, it, creatively they want to be a part of it because it's kind of an interesting, exciting thing where you have um, a production literally coming back to do the show after a while to have learned from its own its own uh, uh, professional pathway and also to learn from the show's successes and mistakes. Um, and, you know, with a lot of media interest, maybe that sort of draws people back and go, yeah, I want to be part of this. Yeah, 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 I can go with that. Uh, now, on a related topic, because it all is related, and uh, something that we regularly come back to on this podcast is streaming services. And, you know, Netflix, Prime, iPlayer, Disney+. Plus. Now, there is a report that the BBC is in talks with Disney to stream Doctor Who from the, uh, the the next the next era of the show, essentially, um, the talks are apparently at an early stage. Disney Plus wouldn't own Doctor Who, but would have the rights to stream the series across foreign territories, just as it does with shows like The Walking Dead. Uh, we don't know whether or not it would be simply from the next Russell T D uh, Russell T Davies era, <laughs> or from the entire New Who era, or even the entire show. It's I mean, what do you think of it? And um, there's a lot of potential for this, and there is, you know, with with things that have happened lately in terms of multiverses and things, it wouldn't be out of place. Then again, we have Doctor Who's kind of uh, comic world relationship with Marvel already. Marvel, obviously, owned by Disney. Yeah. Do you think this is something that can happen? I'm I'm, I'm not sure it's going to dig into any of that crazy Death Said Fantastic Four stuff. <laughs> doctor or anything but i mean you could see on disney plus couldn't you i i don't think it's going to go down the multiverse route i think that would be an entirely different kettle of fish and a far more difficult negotiation with the bbc because yeah, yeah. that would be a um would be them losing creative control to some degree over their work which i can't see them doing not with a flagship which doctor who <laughs> it still is a flagship for those who seem to believe that it isn't anymore um i can't see that happening i think this is what we sort of said many times before that this is the way that it was going to have to go that to keep it to get its global reach the show to, to continue being something of a you know of a, of a powerhouse for bbc is got to look at the way that it's uh, distributed i am so in a sense i am pleased in a sense i find the consolidation of so many properties under singular um, singular companies uncomfortable. Oh yes, as I'm sure we all do to some degree. This, uh, it's yes, it, it, it creates a far more difficult market for creatives. It sort of narrows down opportunities. I, it's not just about that. Oh, Disney is awful or, or whatever people want to say it's just simply whoever it is as soon as whoever it is owns so much of your media it starts to create problems which we've seen in the past as well in the 20th century with the studios so yeah in that sense not great but in another sense pretty cool you know that it would have a a good profile you know and it's got a good profile and it's got a place where people around the world can see it easily that will potentially add to its longevity. So I've seen all the worries and the angers at the mouse now having Doctor Who, and I think a lot of it is just um, just over-exaggerated or people not quite understanding what's going on um, or people just, just being uh, quite possessive about their British show, which, to be honest, the BBC is as well. So it's not actually an insult to them. It just seems to be a way of the Britishness that, we, you know, 
Or Disney very, Plus very is a, yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Critical, yeah, yeah. Disney Plus is a strange thing to me. Uh, we, we we kind of use it only when there's something on, as it were, almost. You know what I mean? It's it's it, something like um, iPlayer. You can use most of the time. You're dipping in and out of because there's things there that you probably want to check out. Amazon Prime again. There's a lot in there. Some excellent movies in there to um, for, for your weekends. Um, uh, what's the other one? Give me another one. Now, another one on me. Now, now TV. We occasionally go for Now TV if we want to um, spend a few weeks watching music documentaries on Sky Arts. Um, I love I love the Sky Arts music documentaries. They're so good. Um, and and that's that. And then with Disney Plus, it's like we only watch Disney Plus if there's actually a series on. So we went weeks and weeks without watching Disney Plus at all. Um, and then recently, we've watched Miss Marvel. We absolutely love Miss Marvel. Really, such a good show. And we're also watching the second series of Only Murders in the Building. And when those both finished, I'm not convinced we'll be watching the um, the, the Cassian Andor show, for example. And obviously, we watched um, Obi Wan Kenobi. Um, I don't think we'll be watching Cassian Andor because I, I, my wife's not really interested in it. Um, I'm not sure we'll be watching the next Marvel series either. So it's it's a bit, it's like it's there, and you, you but you you feel like you don't want to unsubscribe to it as well. Which well, then it's doing it's, them. That, they, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's it's very much how their you know how their model works, isn't it? I mean, I've been Completely. thinking this last week, uh, looking at my like, do I could I get rid of some of these streamers? Because I mean, there is a crazy thing that because they're not annual. Obviously, some people do with Prime. Um, you know, you can just dip in and out, just drop them for a month, and then come back if you want to. There's nothing yeah. to stop you doing that, and we don't. Because uh, I was thinking that with Disney, and then I was thinking, oh, but I'm still watching Legion, and it's season three of Legion, and I'm really, you know, I want to finish that. And I started Miss Marvel, and I've not got too far with it. I and mean, that's the way the streams need to work, and I find that very difficult because I have Prime, but that's on an annual, yep. which is going up soon, which is disturbing. But yeah, you know, when Amazon has to raise its prices against a cost of living, given that. You know, you know how much money Amazon makes. It's a, it's a, yeah. But um, Amazon, as you say, it's got some good stuff. Uh, Netflix. I know people rag on Netflix a lot these days, but uh, I mean, I love it for the Korean dramas. They've got some great Korean dramas, and uh, um, the extraordinary Attorney Wu seems to be hitting off well in the West, which is a really good series if you're interested in. Uh, 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 law dramas uh, based around uh, uh, char- lead character who's autistic. It's a really good show. Yeah, it is hard to... for a long time until very recently and I started watching Man vs. B. Oh, I was tempted with that. I don't know why. It's nice. It's just something. Yeah, I quite like yeah. it. It's kind of nice because he's not... He looks... Obviously, he looks like Mr. Bean for very obvious reasons. Then again, I say that, he still doesn't look anything like Edmund Blackadder. So, you know... Um, mm. And and he's kind of a nice character, which is a bit of a change for him because you know Johnny English and Mr Bean and Blackadder, they're both they're, they're all very yeah. varying degrees of a holes, aren't they? And whereas this guy, yeah. he's he's more he's more of an inept fool who is well meaning and quite a pleasant man. So that's kind of a nice turn for it. And it's the, the whole setup is very good as well. So I think, and the special effects of the bee are very good too. So there's some good things. Oh, well, I, I might watch it. I might watch it. It's I just finish Stranger Things. It's very well. odd because it's more like a movie, and they've, they've, they've cut uh, it up into ten minute episodes. How is that? Yeah. I, no, I've not watched it. I've just been tempted and I've seen it scroll through. But yeah, um, Stranger Things. Been watching that. So yeah. um, good. Amazon Prime. Uh, uh, Vox Machina's a very interesting. Uh, cartoon based on a D legacy which is a again a, a fascinating strand of uh, business and creativity that has uh, evolved in from that um yeah it's just hard to drop them isn't it and yet it is, with it the cost of livings going up you're like i need to drop some of this stuff really and what do you do and i agree with you disney looks like the weaker one and yet somehow it isn't it's got a lot of good stuff on there strangely but uh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. we um we stumbled into the penultimate episode of Game of Thrones last night. Oh, oh dear, yes. Well, you say, you say, oh dear. Now, obviously I'm watching this completely out of context this time. Every other episode of Game of Thrones I've watched in order. I haven't watched a full episode of Game of Thrones 
We watched the um, the first five minutes of the pre credit sequence of the very first episode uh, about six weeks ago. We've ne- that, that's the only thing we we've watched out of order until last night, and we watched the penultimate episode. So and so I, wait so what what was so when you've watched them all in order up to when to, from beginning to end. Okay, and then you just dipped back into the penultimate. Then accidentally dipped back into the penultimate episode last night after accidentally hitting the very beginning of the first episode a few weeks ago. Um, then, I see. Yeah, and but we watched the entire thing, and it was it was very very different watching it without the whole weekly thing, without knowing because it, it took about half an hour before we worked out which episode it was as well. Um, <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't check. We just thought we watched it. We didn't. But no one but could be bothered to pick up the remote control just to see <laughs> the legend. So, you know, series six, episode five, or series eight, episode five. So so we're watching quite a bit of it, and it felt very different. It didn't feel when I watched it in 2018, 2019, whenever it was. <laughs> it felt like it was a bit of a rush to the end. Whereas yeah. watching it last night, and I think these are sort of 80 minute episodes or something like that, um, it didn't feel a rush at all. It seemed, it just, it seemed well paced. Now, this might be because I was watching it on Sky Atlantic and you get adverts every 10 minutes. Um, it may have been partly because of that, I'm not sure, but it did feel uh, in, in this completely different context. It felt completely different to as it did watching it as part of the series and knowing that. The following episode was the last episode. Well, look, look, step back, Doctor Who fans. Just, just back off. I'm going to talk <laughs> about this. I, I, do, I think the the problem was with this was the series felt rushed. I think after almost to a comical point that they they they'd had uh, creatures from the north slowly coming down for six to seven seas series. And then suddenly that's over in two episodes, yeah. two, three, epi- three yeah, episodes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was where it felt like, almost like a Monty Python sketch of, you know, um, a sort of an expansion of Sir Lancelot sort of rushing towards the castle for ages. And then suddenly he's there and it's over. It, it's that kind of problem with it. Um, I, I actually found most of the episodes I had in themselves, I didn't have much of an issue with. And I thought that I've always said Game of Thrones should have ended on that episode. The end of that episode should have been it. Um, it would have been a dark and sort of uh, open-ended end to it, which told you everything you needed to really know about the show, which was like kind of, yeah, yeah. You, picked your, you, pe- you picked your leader and that's what happens. <laughs> you pick the wrong one, which just felt totally in tone with the whole show. Um, totally in tone with the idea that, you know, that there are no beginnings and ends in Game of Thrones. It just... Um, you know, life just moves on and with different challenges. So, you know, you get to that point and yeah, you've screwed up. You've picked the wrong person, mate, and yeah, yeah, they've yeah. lost it. And I even found, uh, you can see I'm being careful after a few years in case people haven't watched it. I even found um, her, he says, giving some away, um, her her path in season six made total sense to me. I was really surprised when people were just going like, oh, I couldn't stand it because suddenly she... Uh, she changed her personality and she she started doing things which weren't in her. And I thought they were exactly in her. You've got someone who has been propped up by other people to keep her, you know, to keep, to keep strong. And then by that episode, she's lost it all. You know, she's not got the people advising her anymore. And she is uh, angry and sometimes quite an, uh, quite a brutal leader. And that's what you get. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I found it absolutely fine. What, what got me was the episode after. <laughs> Which was terrible it on so many levels. The rings, doesn't it? At the end. Yeah, uh, yeah, and it just tries to cross T's and dot I's in the way that doesn't need to, and spends most of its time trying to almost establish potential spin-offs that they could backdoor in the future, which apparently they are going to do now. Um, With Matt Smith, uh, which brings us to Doctor Who. Well done. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so that that's the um, that is the roundabout way of us saying that there is a rumor that the <laughs> Doctor Who may be streamed globally on Disney Plus, or it yeah. may not. Early early negotiations are taking place. Um, now we we I'm um, just going. We are going I mean, to... even even, Dis- even Disney Plus at that point must be going like, well, wait a sec. Yeah, you know, this isn't about Doctor Who. It's no even long about us. You know, you've gone past this. You're now talking about stuff that's on Sky and now TV. <laughs> you know, it's, you you've just you've just blown us both back. Yeah, you do don't it. do that to the mouse. Ah, do what I like to a mouse. Yeah. Bit of cheese. It's anyone's. Um, Chris Chibnall has yep. 
Stead, he's not writing for Doctor Who ever again. Did Moffat say that? <laughs> I'm pretty um, sure he did. Yeah, speaking... To, and so did Russell T. Davies. Uh, speaking to mm. Radio Times, Chris Chibnall says, absolutely never again, clear red line, final script. I never expected to come back after working with Stephen, really, and I turned it down a couple of times after that. I never thought I'd be off of the job and built into... That is why I wanted to keep it to a very specific three-series thing. Uh, but when he was originally announced, apparently it was a five-year plan. But there you go. But then very early on, I mean, I remember you know, when we were talking about it, it was there were suggestions it would be a three-year thing. Yes. So I think it has been a three-year thing for a while. Whether when he went into the idea of it, it was going to be five years is different. But I think certainly during the first year, it was clearly a three-year thing. Yeah. So it was yeah. him and Jodie, wasn't it? Jodie was also like, it's a three-year thing. Yes. It's, um, well, I mean, it's, it, I mean, it's not people. I mean, you know, people come into a job saying I'll do it for this length of time. It's like a football manager mm-hmm. saying that they're yeah. going to win the league in the yeah. next season or whatever. And you know, it doesn't happen. Manager leaves after six weeks of the first season because they're bottom of the league and uh, doesn't turn out the way they planned it. You know, nothing's ever going to turn out the way you planned it. Doctor Who's had uh, like three series across five years, so. You know, it's not big. I mean, there's more important things in life to worry about than things like that, isn't it? Really, it's just a TV show, guys. No, really, yeah. it is. So, um, so I know Gerald's got something to say on about. There you go. Well, everything's back to normal now. So, uh, yeah. So that's what Chibnall says about it, and it's. I mean, I would like to see him back again. We, um, James and I did a series of podcasts earlier this year about Chibnall's previous Doctor Who contributions. And a couple of his new series of his era contributions to the show. He hasn't been a bad Doctor Who writer, and he's done some interesting scripts. And I mean, we, we both largely enjoyed Flux. So yeah, we're going to leave the Chris Chibnall era behind in a few weeks' time, and it's going to be looked upon in a very different way to how it was actually at the time. Very much like most things are, uh, yeah, you know mankind humankind civilization looks back on things and it's very different looking back on it to how it was actually living through it so or more specifically the mccoy years because <laughs> yes. because that was the time which everyone loathed and hated in dog <laughs> 2 fandom up until 2006 and 2007 when suddenly yeah. it was like the the golden opus as much as john Perry's era yes I, I remember that change i remember that shift mates i yeah, remember yeah. i remember that as well that was bizarre Especially as you yeah. know, you, you could be, you could be. There was this thing, wasn't there, called Usenet, and those news groups, <laughs> um, and those things called flame wars in the late nineties. Oh yeah. Um, over <laughs> who was the best doctor, <laughs> John Pertwee or Sylvester McCoy? There was no, no one else got to look in. It was like A was best or B was best, basically. It wasn't anything to do with Hartnell or Troughton or Baker for obvious reason because he's the winner. Um, Davison, the other baker, or even McGann. It was always between Pertwee and. Well, it, it was. It was. Well, it's, it's, it was what it was about. Essentially, it was about classicists and romanticists. Yes, because that's really what it is. Because the Pertwee era was a, carried the very traditional fans sat in the Pertwee era that that was the best, while the McCoy era, which, well, to be fair, the Pertwee era did this as well. It sort of mixed things up a bit and was doing some very unusual things at the back end. And it was. That is the sort of you know it was. That seems to be the uh, the, the, the the sort of there was a lot of romantic love of that era. There was an acknowledgement that it wasn't perfect, yeah. but there was something special going on. Which the, the the classic Doctor Who fans, which is what they seem to seem to be the ones who were very much uh, very much that Doctor Who was framed in a very very particular way and worked in a very particular way, and therefore Pertwee was a perfect example of perfect Doctor Who, um, and they would look at. McCoy and go, you know, Happiness Patrol, what's that with, you know, Bertie Bassett? And people go, well, actually, there's a, you know, a strong political subtext there that's talking about uh, um, 80s conservative values. And But that would be ignored. There was that sort of really weird fight going on between these two, um, which was which was crazy because they both mixed things up. Both theories mixed things up. Both of them had very traditional elements. Um, and both of them, their doctors are kind of against the grain. I mean, the Pertwee Doctor was very much against the grain of what Troughton had been and what Arnold had been, and McCoy ended up being very much against the grain of pretty much all of them, to a large degree. It's just like, yeah, but those battles. And then, yeah, they were all great. 
And it yeah. was now Eccleston that was the problem. Well, well, Christopher Eccleston says he's recorded something special for the 60th anniversary for Big Finish. Nothing to do with television, and I think it's probably going to stay that way. But just going back to what you were saying there, I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, as I expect you to, and as you always do, but I think that the reason why the McCoy era was reappraised is because you can draw a line from various oh, yeah, late yeah. era McCoy stories, but certainly survival through yeah. Rose and onwards in terms of pace and, 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 and well, just, yeah, mainly the pace and the style of the show as well. I th- if you watch survival compared to um, time of the Rani, they feel very, very different, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's, yeah. Um, you know, remembrance of the Daleks is a very, very quick cut show. There's so many fast sh- um, edits throughout uh, Remembrance of the Daleks. I remember watching Remembrance of the Daleks at the time. I hadn't been very impressed with the previous series. So uh, when it started, when the when you know when that 25th anniversary series started, and I watched Remembrance of the Daleks, I was absolutely blown away by how good it was back in 1988. I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I, I had a similar feeling. I was I never connected to uh, Colin Baker, and I kind of watched it because you know there was not much else on, um, and then. The, time of the rani was very much i don't know didn't really work but like you said it came to remember as the daleks it's like this is actually but i think what's interesting as well i think you're totally right i think you know the survival rose connection is a big thing yeah i think also there was again going on this this line that i seem to be enjoying at the moment the sort of romantic level of the um new adventures which very much looked to open up and break boundaries and do something new and sort of challenge and sort of find sort of new, wonderful, exciting, colourful and beautiful ways of of, of the, doing Doctor Who, um, which again, as you that also fed through into the new series because the writers of the new series had been sort of either interested in that era or were actually writing in that era. So you have this sort of, and I think that also helped give the McCoy era a certain amount of uh, credibility but even then, that was still being fought by the the, the classicists who were furious at, you know, Benarinovich's uh, transit novel with the comments about um, the sex worker and having the taste of semen in her mouth, which exploded with anger for many years to come. That, that How dare they? And all the yeah. swearing. And you don't do this in Doctor Who. You know, it should be like the Perway era. Oh, my God, it wasn't Mind of Evil. Brilliant. And the Sea Devils. And it was amazing. It's like, yeah, they were good. But this is something different. And there was the, these battles that were kind of like this, because I think the McCoy era was t- doing, but what kind of thing, what Chibnall era was trying to do, to some degree, was trying to find new ground for the show. Um, and the classicists just didn't like it. And funnily enough, we go in circles, don't we? And you could almost say the Chibnall era was doing a bit of that again. Whether it was successful or not is another matter, but it was certainly trying to find new grounds. Uh, you know, the, the female doctor, the... Uh, timeless child you know it was sort of going back and sort of trying to do a slightly different dynamic with companions it was trying to do different things um again like you said it's it's, we can all agree or disagree on how successful that was but yeah i can't even remember why we were talking about um anything anymore well that's usually why 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 Why? that is usually the way the show goes 